What's going on, everybody? And welcome to this edition of the Links and Locks Best Bets podcast presented by Bet365. I'm Jason Sobel from the Action Network. He is Ben Everell from Golf Bet. We've got so much to get into, including <laughs> just a little victory lap from last week. I hate the victory lap, by the way. We'll talk about that in a second. But uh, before we go any further, a reminder, the Links and Locks podcast is proudly presented by Bet365, the world's favorite sportsbook brand. Sign up with promo code ACTION to get Bet365's exclusive sign-up offer. Bet $1 on any game and get $200 in bonus bets. Must be 21 or older. Offer available in Colorado, New Jersey, Ohio, and Virginia in the U.S. Gambling problem? Call or text 1-800-GAMBLER. Benny, as mentioned, we uh, we get to take that victory line. I, and I said, I, I hate doing this. Like, I do not like bright. I don't go on social media and go, hey, everybody, look at me. I got to pick right. But it's kind of cool when we come on the podcast and go, we had the same outright pick last week. And I get it. He was the second favorite in a not great field at the Mexico Open. But you and I both with Tony Fino on the podcast last week. Yeah, mate. I think it's the first time we both connected with the absolute outright, right? Um, yeah. So that's pretty cool. Um, as you said, look. It's baby steps. We know it was the Mexico Open. We know it was the second favorite. Um, but basically, pretty much everything or a lot of the things you certainly said last week came true. You know, like the number was too short on Ram. Uh, he he had a chance to beat Tony, of course, um, just couldn't quite get it done. Uh, and it, it turned out well. Uh, you know, shout out a few other picks you had there too, mate. And I know that I might have mentioned Brendan Wu getting on up there and he contended. So I think we were... I don't know, whatever we were drinking last week, hopefully we've been drinking it this week so we can help in this designated event at Quail Hollow when we get the, the Wells Fargo Championship with, um, let's just say that the field's a little deeper this week. Uh, yes, it is. And we're <laughs> going to get to that in just a second. I want to mention because there is some still pessimism towards Tony Finau, which is ridiculous and stupid. But uh, Tony Finau, who for so long had criticism being lobbed his way that he couldn't close out PGA Tour events, couldn't win. Now has five wins in the last 20 months, has two wins this season. And of course, the narrative has switched to from Tony Finau can't win to Tony Finau can't win against a bigger field because some <laughs> of his wins have been against slightly inferior fields. My contention is that I don't think it comes later this month in the PGA Championship, but watch out for next month at the U.S. Open. And coincidentally enough, you are just off the golf course at LACC. Mm -hmm. You were there for media day today. Tell us a little bit about what you saw and has what you saw, what you've seen at LACC changed your mind or helped form an opinion on what type of player you might like there. Uh, my year was awesome. It was good of the USGA to have us out there today. Um, got to play 18 holes there at LACC. Obviously I played off a slightly more forward tee box and the boys will play <laughs> when they get there. Uh, in what, about 45 days, I think it was, when we'll see it. Uh, look, some small targets to aim at, some larger ones too, but sections of those greens are going to be nice and tricky for guys to get to. Um, it's not the longest joint, but it's a par 70. Uh, and I think that it, it's going to be pretty much the guys that we've thought um, going along, but you're going to need to roll the rock. Like, if you don't putt well, you're going to find yourself in three-putt territory a lot. If you don't find those small segments of the greens, wherever they put those pins, uh, you're going to need to bring your putter. And as all US Opens will be, there is some gnarly stuff off the edges of the greens, some deep, already um, terrible rough and and things around those bunkers and, and, and whatnot. And there's also spots to run up uh, the ball, though, which is nice to see they've given that look as well at LACC. So... Um, I'm really looking forward to it, as you can imagine. I think it's going to be an epic contest. Um, and as I sort of tweeted earlier, I can confirm that the hospitality uh, box, if you will, down the right side of the first, can uh, the, the plexiglass is pretty strong. It, ref, it you know can send a hosel rocket back to the woods of the fairway pretty easily. Uh, so that was nice of it because, yeah, one of the uh, bogeys I made today, probably without that there, might have been a triple or, or even a quad. Yeah, well, that hurt me because I'm already 0 for 1 on the week. I lost my finishing position bet, my final <laughs> score bet. I took the over, and you actually uh, you shot a very respectable 93, Betty, if I could tell the people that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Look, for uh, me, that's really good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, getting a lot of pops, too. That that might have won the net division out there, I think. 
Yeah, look, the, the reality was, as I said, I, uh, it's those greens. They're pure. They were pure as. Um, and if I do have a strength, and that's I'm, people who can't see, I'm doing the air quotes and inverted commas, etc. Like uh, it is my putting, um, and I didn't have any three putts today, so uh, that mm. certainly cut down my score a lot. Uh, I had a cool caddy out there. Um, you know, he gave me the lines and I was able to pretty much hit him where he wanted. So that was cool. I cannot wait for next month when John Rom three putts the <laughs> final green and walks off into a press conference setting and you, Ben Everill, say to him, uh, John, I didn't three putt here at all over 18 holes. How come you three putted today? And I'd <laughs> just like to see the look on, on John's face after you ask him that I will. question. As much as I just gave my putting a wrap, I will say this. The ninth is a par three, a long one. As many, they have some great par threes out there. And I must have hit it 30 yards long past, you know, with my five iron way over the back of this green. I decided I was going to putt from 30 yards behind the green. And I did putt it onto the green, off the green, back down the front <laughs> and into the rough. So that was a good double I made there. So not all my putts were great. Let's just say yeah, that. Okay. Well, yeah. that, that doesn't count as a putt. It was used oh. you used putter, but it was off the green. It's yep. not an actual putt. So, all right. Mm -hmm. We'll uh, we'll keep uh, our buddy Justin Ray compiling those stats. He's the uh, <laughs> yes. so, um All right. Let's get on to the... Wells Fargo Championship, uh, the guy I just mentioned, John Rahm, is not in the field. Neither is Scotty Scheffler and a few other uh, big-name players this week, but it is a designated event, and so we do have a lot of big names there. Rory McIlroy is the favorite in the field, and as always, we're about to play 18 holes, make 18 bets. Ben Everill, you are on the tee once again for the second time today. I don't know what you did off the, the first tee at LACC today, but uh, you're going to need to hit this one long and straight. <laughs> uh, let's just say I duck hooked it and then I hosel rock with the next one. But other than that, um, mate, I am going to surprise a few people here with my first outright pick, not because of who it is, but because it's not coming later as my very big outright pick at the end. And so my second best outright pick for the week is a man from down under, my man, Jason Day. Uh, I'm, I think I saw him at about 25 to 1. I wish he was a little higher. He's the 2018 champ at Quah Hollow. He loves the joint. Um, you know, he parted the dots off it back then. Uh, and that's in interesting enough, like the, the winners at Quail Hollow recently, Homer Day, um, Rory, uh, all putted really well to win, but not necessarily the whole field. You know, like strokes game putting wasn't necessarily the absolute key factor, but it was a big enough factor that it was important um, along with driving distance. And so Jason can hit it a long way. And this year, he is getting back to his best in putting. He's 13th in strokes game putting. He's hitting it well at the moment. I know there'll be people who say, oh, at the Masters, he got in contention and he crapped himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he did. He absolutely did. But he was hitting it well up to that point. You know, like I so said, he's just got to put it all together. Um, he loves the join, as I said. It's his sort of course. Um, I think he's a big, big, big show this week. So... I concur with everything you say. I, I am going to skip over my original uh, hole number two pick, and I'm going to go to my Jason Day play because it segues very well. I've got him for a top 10 this week. I, I told you before we started the pod, and as always, for those who don't listen every single week, you and I, we might talk a little bit before the pod, but we don't talk about our picks at all. And so we get uh, we get on the pod, we start recording, and uh, for last week, for instance, I think we had four or five of, if not the same picks, the same players in different yep, spots yep. on the card. And so I, I told you that before we started tonight, I, I bet we have three or four of the same names. This was one of the names that I assumed we would both have on the card. I've got Jason Day for a top 10 at plus 300. And I think you said it all right there. Uh, he's played well at Quail Hollow in the past, 2018 champion at uh, Quail Hollow. And um, you look at what he did at the Masters, top 10, Going into the final round, shot 67, 72, 74, and then blew up with an 80 on Sunday, finished in 39th place. But uh, look, one outlier round should not be cause for recency bias a month later. And I do think that some people will jump off the Jason Day bandwagon just a little bit based on that finish there. But other than the one round, he's had a really, really good year, and that should continue. And I'm not going to downgrade him because – one Sunday a month ago, he didn't play that well. And so I, I'm with you. I, I I think he's too short for the outright market for me. And I've got a couple of guys who are short plays in that market already. So I don't want to load up on 
too many more short numbers, but for a top 10, three to one, I think Jason Day makes sense. Oh, I love that you're on board, my man. Yeah, you know, and, <laughs> and as always, um, you know, you, you got to also get a gauge. As, you know, this is Monday night, as we always, as, as we always say when we record this. Um, I'm not at Koala, but we've got people there. I'll be uh, having a chat to the ones that talk to Jason and probably trying to give Jason a call myself just to really lock in where his mindset is, uh, how things are going at home, et cetera. Um, I wish it was 35, 40, 50 to one because I think he could yes. really, really rock at home I at that feel price. The but... same way about a couple of my plays. I'll <laughs> be one of those in a minute, but you're up first, hole three. Okay, hole three. Well, you just did your top 10, so I'll give you my top 10. And this is, uh, I'm going to tell you this I've got a top five and another winner, obviously, come, but I think this person I'm giving him top 10, but he could easily be an outright pick for anybody as well. I'm getting 230 uh, for a top 10. And that's Victor Hovland. I think that, uh, look, he's one of the best T to green players we have. Um, you know, he was T3, I believe, when he went to Quail Hollow in 2021. Yeah. Uh, and I just think that, well, well, what's his weakness? His weakness is chipping, et cetera. Well, if you look at all the data, this is one of the courses that around the green stats aren't as important as some other venues on tour. So with that being said, he'll still need to putt okay, He'll still need to putt well, but hopefully his chipping, which is his weakness, won't be as exposed as much in this event. Uh, I think that's reasonable value in inverted commas, 230 for a top 10. And I wouldn't be surprised if he won the tournament. Well, you and I are two for two in mentioning the same names on the pod, except <laughs> I'm going to hold off until later in the podcast to tell oh, you about yeah. Victor Hovland. So there you go. I think you know, regular listeners, where I'm going with that. All right, fourth hole, I'm going to go back to... Uh, it's really not a long shot. So what we've seen uh, over the first eight designated events of this PGA tour year, mm. we've seen Scotty Scheffler or John Rom win five of these. Each of them was 12 to one or shorter. So, you know, there's, there's certainly a, uh, there, there's a trend there, which is one of the two best players in the world likes to win designated events. That won't happen this week because neither of them are playing, but short numbers on them. Fitzpatrick was 30 to one at Harbor town. Burns was 40 to one at the match play. Kitayama, the lone real long shot at mm -hmm. a, to win a designated event. He was around 200 to one going into the API. All of that said, my long shot this week isn't very long. In fact, I was hoping, like you said earlier for about day for a 45 or 50 to one number. I'm going to suck it up because I think this is going to be a really big week for Ricky Fowler, even oh. though five to one is a short number, but Ricky has played really well on this golf course in the past. I believe four top tens in nine starts at quail. And that doesn't include another top 10 at the 2017 PGA championship. And he's played some great golf this year. I look at him very much the same way that I looked at Tony Finau last week, which was the performances there and the results are just good. They're not great yet, but when you have the good performance, when the strokes gained in all the right categories are, are trending in the right direction, those good results are coming. I think something big is coming for Ricky Fowler. This week makes so much sense uh, for one and done pools, for DFS, for a lot of different reasons, but I will certainly have an outright on Ricky, even if I don't like that 35 to one number. Yeah. I mean, I hadn't got, there's one that wasn't on my radar, mate, but you've given all the good reasons. Um Interesting. Yeah. I would have thought he would have been a little higher. Um, so yeah, it's somebody thinks like you at the books, right? They think he's going to have a good week. All right. I'll give you my long shot. He's a little longer. Radio listeners won't be surprised at this pick either. We're we playing the down under music again, but I'm going to give you Adam Scott at hundred to one. And there's another Aussie who's a little bit further out um, that I'm going to mention in, in a little while for another market, but I'll just let you look at the boards Think Australian, think big hitter, think someone who played at Quail Hollow yep. somewhat recently. I, you can stop now. I've got him on my card already, and I'm going to beat <laughs> you to it. So don't worry about <laughs> it. All right. So well, there, yeah, Cam Davis is another one at 121, 30 to 1. I'll get to him in the market where I'm going to look to play him uh, later. But Adam Scott at 100 to 1, I've slated here. Um, look, again, driving distance, he hits it as big as some of the other guys. He's going to get it out there. He's going to be very accurate off the tee um he's going to be you know relatively accurate into the greens and he knows the place and and you know was in that president's cup as well recently so has seen it somewhat recently again i just think in 
this field, it's rare that you get someone that that good uh, yeah. at this number. So yeah. Adam Scott, 100 to 1 is a chance. You and I have talked about Adam that it, we think he's got one more big win in him somewhere. Adam thinks he has at least one more big win himself. It's just I think it's going to surprise us if and when it does come because he's just he's I you know there's there's no criticisms right now of Adam Scott. The swing still looks terrific. He's still motivated, which I'm sort of surprised by. I thought Adam Scott would get into his 40s and just sort of go, all right, mm-hmm. bye guys. I'm I'm going to go back and you know, live on the beach and hang out and surf and you won't see me too much. But uh, the fact that he's still playing high level golf and still interested in playing high level golf, I think is a really good sign. I just don't know when it's going to happen. And so uh, give moving you... on to the, yes, Betty. Oh, sorry. I'll just give you one little other tip. Like, um, you know, Australian golf was in, let's say the headlines recently, um, which didn't involve Adam Scott, you know, a little chip on the shoulder to put himself back in the headlines and back in the, back up there uh, to remind Aussies back home that he also has still got what it takes. So another reason I like it this week. All right. I like that. All right. Uh, Sixth hole. I'm I'm moving around some plays here too, because as I mentioned, I would like to beat you to one of your picks and I've got (laughs) on the card written down already. It's in my column already this week. If you think I'm just stealing from Benny, uh, it's already written Cam Davis top 20 this week. Three top 20s in his last four starts. Look, Cam was one of the guys coming into this year that you and I talked about that uh, we both really, really were bullish on. Thought he would be very good. You reported on the situation where he had an illness at the beginning of this year, missed five straight cuts. It was like, whoa, is he just like not good? We didn't really know what was going on. Turns out as soon as he got healthy, he started playing great golf. Sixth place at the Players' Championship. He was seventh a couple weeks ago at the RBC Heritage Cam Davis is indeed back. This is a place where way back at the beginning of the year, before I even knew that he was not feeling well, knew that he wasn't playing well, this is a place where I had his name written down and targeted. So the fact that he's playing well, once again, top 20 plus 350, one of my favorite plays on the board. And I I know I just said a minute ago, I'm not playing long shots at the designated events. If I was going to play one this week, just one outright, little sprinkling, Cam Davis at 150 to one is a really nice number. Yeah, look, uh, all right, I'll jump straight to what the seventh hole where I have him. I only said top 40 at 125, uh, but I'm being super conservative. They're trying to not show Australian bias. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, he is by all reports back. I don't know. There's nothing I know of that, that should hamper him this week at Quail. Uh, he's, Obviously played in the President's Cup there, got super, super confident by doing that. Um, that's where all his confidence comes from as well in his game, plus obviously he'd won before that. But to really believe he stepped up in that environment, won with Adam Scott out there in one of their matches, et cetera, he was the dominant force uh, in that. Um, yeah, 125 top 40. And I had another top 40 I was throwing here as well. Um, a guy who's... You know, hitting it a long way, actually. Driving distance in all drives this year. This bloke is ninth on tour. And this is a, uh, again, this is an important stat for this tournament. Um, and that's um, Byung Han Arn, Ben Arn. Ben yeah. Arn is another one that I like, plus 130 for a top 40. Has a sneaky potential to be the, I keep calling it the Nick Taylor, because that's what, uh, when we had the w, uh, Waste Management Phoenix Open, um, the guy that, that had a crack, I think Davis and Ben Arn can be the potential Nick Taylor. Yeah. Uh, okay. I like that. I certainly like Davis this week. I'm going to go to the eighth hole and kind of work my way back up the props board. I'm going to a top five here. Ben, you mentioned T to green is important this week. We're looking mm. for some flushers, right? Yeah. I don't know. Is Cameron Young any good at hitting a golf ball? I, I, <laughs> ah, <laughs> for you. Guard, I love it. <laughs> pull another one of your plays. Got me. Look, this guy, I don't think we quite understand because hmm. even though he's got 10 top three finishes since joining the PGA Tour a year and a half ago, uh, he does not have that elusive first victory. So I think people are sort of like, oh, Cameron Young, he's good. He's got some potential. I don't think people still quite understand, still realize just how impressive and talented this guy is, especially off the tee. Cameron Young is really, really, really good. He's going to be a top 10, maybe even top five player before too long. I am taking him for a top five this week at plus 550. And I I wouldn't be surprised if it's another top three finish 
yeah. as he's had, like I said, so many of them in the past, and it could be that elusive victory finally. Oh, mate, you heard me groan there. I have the exact same slot for him. Ninth hole, Cameron Young, top five, 550, 500, where, wherever you're looking. Uh, you know, look, second in driving distance this year. Um, I think he's, what, second on, in total driving as well, 18th tee to green. It, it, it's a course that should suit him. Why is he not one of my outrights? Because he hasn't won yet, you know, like, and I'm just I'm just not certain that he um, is going to be able to do that with this strength of field. He's proven he can definitely muster it, um, and I wouldn't be surprised if he does. Like I said about Hovland um, and Day, et cetera, I think that all these guys have a good chance to win. Uh, he's not going to be afraid of the scenario, put it that way. He's He's ready to go. He's going to eventually knock one of these guys off at some point. Um, oh, I wouldn't be surprised if we see him if he doesn't get one of these big ones soon. Maybe he needs to go do a do a Tony Finau mate and go play in Mexico and beat those guys first and then come back and win. Yeah. But he's okay. like, look, he's too good not to win. Like it's it's of all the big names in this tournament, um, he's the most surprising. It doesn't have a tall win. He's one of the few players that I've seen in the last decade or so that's come out and. Uh... I really believe that most players need to win somewhere, something first before they can go win or even contend for a major championship. I think Cameron Young can just step over that building block of yeah. needing to win something. Uh, he can show up at Oak Hill in a couple of weeks and absolutely win that golf tournament. Yes. Uh, I correct. think he is that good. And uh, he does not, you know, certainly we've seen him in these situations in the past. He's not a guy that gets nervous, not a guy that uh, looks anxious when he's in contention just goes out there and with the same look on his face the entire time, just goes out and does his thing. So I uh, yep. really like Cameron Young this week and every other week as well. All right, before we get to the back nine here, a reminder, the Links and Locks podcast is proudly presented by Bet365, the world's favorite sportsbook brand. Sign up with promo code ACTION to get Bet365's exclusive sign-up offer. Bet $1 on any game, get $200 in bonus bets, must be 21 or older, Offer available in Colorado, New Jersey, Ohio, and Virginia. In the U.S., gambling, call or text 1-800-GAMBLER. Benny, we get to the back nine here. Before we get to the back nine, I wrote about this in my preview this week. Were you on site in 2010 for the Wells Fargo Championship, which I believe was the Quail Hollow Championship that year? No, that was right before, like that. I came on tour with you guys at the beginning of 11. So I did okay. not catch the 2010 season in person working with okay. So we've talked so much about, you know, Netflix series and documentaries in the world of golf. I need some sort of Netflix ESPN 30 for 30 on the 2020, 2010 Quail Hollow Championship, which if you don't remember it, and I wrote about in my preview at the Young action Rory, right? this week. Well, first of all, you've got, Tiger playing his second event after his self-imposed exile. Shoot oh. 74 79. I've never seen Tiger give up. Tiger was walking a hundred yards ahead of his playing partners. Oh. He was spending three seconds over his ball before he hit it. Just didn't care. And I get it. Things were going on in his life, uh, whether it's self self-made or, or not that he had stuff going on. And obviously his mind wasn't in it. I uh, go to Billy Mayfair, the 54 hole leader. We found out, he had been the low handicap of all the pros. There are a ton of pros at Whisper Rock. He told a story, and the only reason I remember Billy Mayfair from that week is that he told a story about when he plays with Phil at Whisper Rock, he had to give him a shot aside. Phil, who had won the Masters a couple of weeks before that, he won the Masters title, and Phil's getting a shot aside from Billy Mayfair, which is <laughs> one of the great gambling stories in professional golf that I've ever heard. Uh, then you go to Phil himself, who was... Two off the lead going into Sunday, shot 68, finished four back, and blasted the greens there. I believe that was the same year where seventh or eighth green, no, twelfth green, where Phil actually putted away from the hole just to prove a point. It was the most Phil Mickelson thing ever. The hole is 20 feet this way. He just putted away from it because he goes, ah, oh, this is just such a bad hole. You can't putt towards it. And, and Phil just sort of embarrassing either himself or the club or something, but um phil did that and then the reason he lost was because rory mcelroy won his first pga tour event that year made a late eagle on friday afternoon to make the cut on the number shot 66 62 on the weekend to wow. win going away and then it was like all systems go for rory and i say that because rory is front of mind this week because i 
I have not looked forward to a press conference, a pre-tournament press conference as much this year as I'm looking forward to hearing from Rory McIlroy and exactly what he has to say, because we haven't heard from him since missing the cut from the Masters and skipping the RBC Heritage. I have no idea what's going on in Rory's mind right now. Yeah, wow. Rory McIlroy, do you need... Well, you, well, after all that, you were obviously setting up to tell me where you're going to bet on him. Is that what you're doing? Because you're on your 11th uh, was just a story. It, it was a whole bunch of stuff that had no bearing on my picks or anything. So would you like me to get to my picks? <laughs> That'd be good. <laughs> no, I mean, I can talk about Rory some more if you like. But it was actually... Um, it's funny because, like I said, I wasn't working in specifically in golf at that point. But yeah. I was watching that tournament. And that was a, a watershed moment. Obviously, Rory McIlroy wasn't long after that I was on tour. And 2011 was a big moment for me where, annoyingly, Rory took down uh, Jason Day in the US Open that year. I was very close with Jason was, um, that year. And he just dominated everybody. And nobody knows what Jace did that week except me because everyone was with Rory. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, let's get back to the picks. 10th tee. I'm up. I'm not picking Rory McIlroy. Uh, by the way, if you guys want to bet Rory this week, He's very short in the outright marketplace. If you want to place matchup bets, whatever it is, uh, one and done. You want to take him this week? At least wait. Do me a favor. If you want to bet Rory, at least wait until you hear Rory speak this week because he's very open. He's very honest. Mm -hmm. If his head is not in the right space, I think he will allude to that. I think he will tell us that he's not ready to go out and win a golf tournament. And and if he is ready, I think he'll tell us that too. If he's rested and recharged and relaxed, I, I think we'll know that. But before you just blindly write Rory McIlroy's name down somewhere for something or bet him somewhere, just wait to hear from him first. I, I think he's probably going to speak Wednesday after the Pro-Am. He's the first one off at 7 in the morning. And so you'll have the whole second half of the day on Wednesday to, to put in any bets on Rory that you'd like. In any case, none of that, like I said, has any bearing on my next pick, which is first-round leader at 70-1, to one, going with Gary Woodland whose ball-striking numbers were very good at the Mexico Open last week. And, Benny, I'm basing this a little bit on Woodland's ball-striking numbers. He's been playing well. He was part of a group that was one shot back at the 2017 PGA Championship after one round. But really, this is about – it's about the fact that a lot of these players have taken, if not just one week, maybe two weeks off since the RBC heritage, I'm not naive enough to think that, you know, someone can't go out and shoot a 65 after being at home last week. But it's the fact that Gary Woodland's competitive juices have been flowing, whereas a a lot of the other big names kind of getting back into it a little bit. I think that bears, bears well for him. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll give you my first round leader and surprise, surprise. I'm going to go to Rory here. This is where I'm going to say that if you're going to look at somebody um, that's a short number as Rory is in the outright market, I think you're silly. I think you need to wait. Uh, I think you also need to wait on exactly what you said. Hear him out. See how he sounds. Watch, you know, golf channel. Watch, read all the stuff um, coming out on pjtour.com in the lead up because, look, I can give you the tip. Rory's got a few extra things to do this week, right? Mm. He's got some things, uh, you, you know, Pro Am, etc. It's a there's a birthday for uh, FedEx FedEx this week that he's a big part of with the commissioner on Wednesday as well. Like he's got some stuff to do. He's you know yeah. playing player commissioner like we've seen him do for the last you know six months or so. Um, so I think we really need to hear from him, hear where his head's at, see how he's going. And I think um, if you must, then look at first round leader or wait for your outright. As I said, live betting after the first round, after the second round, then start really seeing where Rory's at. Uh, so outside of him, as I said, I always like to look at the favorite in that section. This is where I've also slated two guys that haven't made my card elsewhere um, that are obviously very high-end players. They're 40 to 1. I think this is a chance to get them, if they do happen to get a good start, uh, one of them was a former winner. And the defending champion at the other venue, Max Homer, and Colin Morikawa, whose game should suit this place, uh, but not necessarily has he played great here, great, great in the past. So that's where I'd look at those two guys, just because of their all-around game, what they can bring. Um, I think you can get some value on that number there. Okay. Uh, yeah, I like those plays. And um, I'm usually, and, and like I said, I, I went your route and took Rom for a first-round leader play last week. 
That mm. didn't work out. He played well. It just didn't cash the bets. I'm back taking long shots first round leader now. I, <laughs> I, I like your strategy. I understand your strategy. I'm still going long shots for a Thursday uh, mm-hmm. single round bet. All right. 12th hole. I'm going to the top 40 markets, and I've got two players written down here. One is the former loan officer who wasn't even playing professional golf two years ago, Ben Griffin, the rookie who's been very consistent on the PGA Tour so far this year. He's plus 160. The other one coming off a top 10 in Mexico, a big hitter. We talk about T to green being very important. Joseph Bramlett at plus 210. I like Joseph Bramlett to have another solid week again. Uh, for these top 40s, you're only looking for a guy to finish in the top 25% of the field. They, they don't have to be uh, in contention the whole week. They just have to play pretty well. I like each of these guys to play pretty well. If, I, if memory serves, I think Bramlett was a pick I had for a first round later earlier in the year, and he may have cashed or got close to it in one of the events. So maybe if he, if you like him, have a look at his odds in that as well. Probably pretty yeah. astronomical. Um, all right, I'm going to go with a guy. I can't believe you haven't used him yet. Um, you may still have a spot for him. I thought you'd throw this name out before I got a chance to, but this is my top 20 play. And yeah, guy who driving distance, top 10 on tour, likes to smash it out there. Your mate, Keith Mitchell. I think Keith Mitchell, top 20 plus 240. He's had, I think, two top fives in this event before or something crazy like that. Um, What, no, two two top 10s, a T8 and a T3 in his last couple of starts there. He's fifth in the all-around category on tour. Uh, as I said, he smashes the ball, keep it on the planet. Um, I think he is decent number there at plus 240 for a top 20. Yeah, I look, I think the only reason I haven't mentioned Keith Mitchell or Sahith Thigala for that reason is uh, the restraining order. Yeah. <laughs> if, I, if I keep mentioning these guys every week on the podcast, at some point I'm going to get a cease and desist letter from their management teams. And so it, at some point, I you know, it's like crying wolf. I can't just say... See Dalla and Mitchell every single week, even though I like them every week. And, and just on that, I'm going to backtrack us again. We were spot on last week when we said the one guy that was way out of whack on that board for Mexico was Akshay Bhatia. Oh, I yeah. mean, that 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 kid was over, was triple digits. He should have been 50 to one. He almost pulled it out, as we know. He had a pretty good week. Keep an eye on that name. Uh, you know, on his proper weeks, he's going to he's going to surprise others, but not us once he does connect. Um, yeah, the outright that I hit on Finau was very good. As it turns out, the outrights that I would have hit on Akshay would have been much, much, much better at uh, some some triple digit number uh, last week. So that that would have been a good hit. Not that I'm complaining about the uh, the Finau win at all. All right, getting to the 14th all. I've got a couple of good buddies going against each other, and I am taking Justin Thomas in this one over Jordan Spieth. Uh, Look, Justin, I I thought for a long time, plays his best when he's playing angry, when he's got a little chip on his shoulder. Much like John Rahm, much like Brooks Kepka. When JT is mad, he plays better. A lot of guys, they get mad, they play worse. They get frustrated. What I've seen, though, now from JT is that the anger is bleeding into frustration. There's a very fine line here where between... Hey, I'm mad. I'm going to go prove to people that I can go out and win this thing. And abject frustration where he just can't figure out why he's not winning events, why he's not contending on a more regular basis. All of that said, should be good vibes this week, going back to the place where he won his first career major championship. I can't believe it's been six years since the 2017 PGA. Time is literally flying. As for Jordan Spieth, I've talked so much about Jordan I think Jordan's still uh, due for a big one coming up. Maybe the PGA Championship where he could get the career slam. That said, as of Friday last week, Jordan was not in this field. Decided at the 11th hour to play this week. He's got the Nelson coming up. He can't skip that one. Then he's got the PGA. Uh, Colonial at some point is coming up. These are hometown events for him uh, that he really can't skip. At some point, Jordan's looking at the schedule going... I'm basically playing five weeks in a row. There's nothing I can really take off. I I think in the back of his mind, he understands that this is a little bit of a marathon session and not a sprint. I know he went five and oh at the president's cup last year, but I I think back of his mind, he's like, all right, let's, let's not put all our chips on the table for this one. Yeah, I can say that thinking I will say, "Hmm, no, I won't say, but let's just say, what will I say here about Jordan? 
maybe he might not play in some of those events you mentioned. Oh, so maybe yeah. he might uh, have a bit more energy than we think. But you're right, 100. percent He definitely has to play at least the majority, or will play in a majority of things you ticked off there. Um, and even if he's thinking about not, I wouldn't be surprised if he thinks, changes his mind, and puts himself back in those places. So. Um, Thomas is an interesting one, man, because I think we talked about him early in the year. I said we saw him at uh, in Phoenix on the range. I said he just what didn't look happy, looked in that searching mode, wasn't you know things weren't happening for him, and I haven't really seen him be his best since. Um, but it's got to come because he's too Funny, good I, for it. I interviewed him on on the radio show in December at the PNC Championship. He's playing with his dad at a hit and giggle. You're pissed off there about his game. Like, <laughs> at some point, I would love to see. I'm not saying that players have to go around smiling and happy all the time. And but I, I like that, you know, players show their emotions out there. Boy, JT for a while now has just looked like he's in a bit of a dark place with his game. And I, I, I would just like him to sort of maybe take a little bit of that internal pressure off himself and understand that, hey, look, you can't win every week. You can't contend every week, go out there and just do your thing. And I, I do think that at some way it's going to come around. And by the way, if you're ever going to play JT, these are the prices to play him at. I mean, yeah. whether it's the outright market, whether it's matchups, whether it's DFS, God, is he cheap in DFS this week? Uh, these are the prices you want to snap up uh, JT at this week. Yeah, and look, they just had that little their little reunion, didn't they, on their vacation or whatever? What is it? Uh, is it Byron? Bay? What? No, that's Aussie. What am I talking about? Baker's Bay or whatever? I think the boys went like so. You know, maybe he's rejuvenated, relaxed, and whatnot. And he can come out and be that man you need him to be. Um, all right, let's go fifteenth. I'm going to give you some bet three six five player markets. Uh, you know, the juiced markets, the minus one twenty for a position uh, over or above. Um, again, this is a way for me to get in guys who I feel like have a chance to win the whole thing. Uh, but um, with such a deep field, you can only have so many guys on your card. Uh, one you mentioned briefly uh, earlier in Sam Burns, 35th or better, I think um, the course suits him and he may be able to do better than 35th. And the other is my young stud from the President's Cup, Tom Kim, 42nd or better um, for the minus 120 there. Uh, ball striking machine, great memories from Quail. I think he'll be amped. I think he'll be pumped. Um, hasn't quite given me what I was hoping for this season in general since winning, obviously, back in Vegas. Um, but I definitely think he'll be smiling this week. And, and forty better than 40 seconds, it's pretty decent. Yeah, I have written up Kim as a fade for me this week only because I look at the top of the board. There's not anyone that I'm like, yeah, I really don't like him for some reason. And again, I'll, I'll wait to see if maybe that's Rory once we hear from him. But uh yeah kim's just not playing his best golf it's coming at some point uh it's not quite there yet all right we get to the 16th hole i also have a uh, finishing position bet here and I, I just mentioned jt justin thomas i've got another jt for you jt posted okay. playing some really nice golf now a two-time pga tour champion he's starting to come into his own even a little bit more he is 64th or better a north carolina native uh, essentially he's got to make the cut this week he's made the cut in seven of 11 starts so far this year uh, back home uh, or at least sort of home uh, in North Carolina. I, I feel like JT posting to make the cut is a pretty easy bet. And all, of course, all these finishing position market bets at uh, bet three, six, five are all minus minus one twenty. So giving up a little juice there, but uh, posting 64th or better. All right, mate. The postman will maybe deliver for you. We'll see what happens there. But the man I'm going to have deliver for me, so I go two in a row in the outright picks, 17th hole. You said that, you know, designated events around about 12 to 1 is the number that guys win at. Well, I'm going to say that Patrick Cantlay is that man this week. Patrick Cantlay at about the 12 to 1 number is just the type of guy I think that can deliver on this course and it's about Tommy won something big again um it's not been a regular place for him to play he did play there once I think in 2021 and missed the cut but he was three and one uh, in the president's cup uh look he didn't used to play at Bay Hill either and he was fourth there he's just that type that you can plug and play he's good enough uh, I, I don't know I just have a feeling look he's number one on tour in par four scoring number one on tour in par five scoring he is running 17th in putting this year. 
He is hitting the ball 13th longest this year. The numbers just all, all the data just that I was looking at all pointed towards him uh, outside of obviously the course history. Um, so, and with it, as I said, with the fact that it's been that sweet spot in the odds that's sort of been common in these events, I'm going to sit there. Uh, yeah, look, there's never a bad time to pick Patrick Cantlay, and I've been waiting on him uh, to pop for a little while now. So, again, to the 18th hole, I mentioned it earlier. You mentioned uh, Victor Hovland. I said, I'm going to wait till the end, and the end is where I make my favorite outright pick, and it is indeed Victor Hovland this week. He's been terrific. T to green so far this year. He has gained strokes off the tee in every single start. He's gained strokes on approach shots in every start other than Pebble Beach where they only measure two of those rounds at Pebble, just the the rounds at Pebble Beach, not at the other golf courses. So uh, he may have actually uh, been positive strokes gain there with his approach shots as well. But the big thing for me is that Victor Hovland uh, had this glaring weakness in his game. Last year, ranked 191st out of 193 ranked players in strokes gained around the greens. Yeah. This season, Ben, he's up to 168th, which it doesn't really sound like a momentous move at all, but he's losing 0.414 strokes per round less than he did a season ago, which basically means he's been about a half stroke better around the greens each day. That, that's yeah. a huge difference for a guy who's already world-class in every other aspect of the game, just sort of inching closer to field average is a massive improvement and it's paying off recently. Three top tens in his last five starts. You mentioned him earlier. He's been knocking on the door for a little while now. Uh, it does again. And I mentioned this with Ricky Fowler. It feels like the performance is outweighing the results right now. At some point, that big result is coming. I've been waiting for Victor Hovland to win something bigger. And I don't know if that's going to be a major right away, but I do think that a big boy field event uh, for Victor Hovland, it, it's coming very soon. This one makes a whole lot of sense. I hate that the number has moved from 25 to one opening this morning to 20 to one to now at bet three, six, five. He is currently 18 to one. As we record this podcast, at 11 p.m. Eastern time on Monday evening. That's a short number, and that makes me a little skeptical because everybody's on them. But still, I'm not jumping off. I like Victor, and I will play Victor at 18-1, to 1, even if that's what I got to do. Well, mate, I just, just to help you out with the around the green scenario, like this event, I'm um, just looking at the winners at Quail recent times. I mean, Max last year at a different course was 62nd in around the green. But then he, both he and Rory, when they won, more recently at Quail, 41st in the field around the green, still won. Um, Jason Day did play well around the green, but that's his game, you know, putting and and whatever. Uh, Rory way back when, 66th around the green when he won. James Hahn, when he won the tournament, 36th. Like, that's not been the the factor. And that's, again, I spoke about that earlier when I put him in as my top 10 with a, a, definitely a chance to win. Um, this course doesn't uh, highlight that area as much as some others so that should help him dodge some bullets and that should help him you know get it. and you know it, he has been like you said it's just like the odd little section of a round not even a whole round generally speaking it's just little sections here or there off being in the mix every time he's played it feels like so i think that you know and of course he's got an aussie caddy so he's a genius i reckon so you yeah, know I'll, I'll, I'll back you but i still i still like can a day um Young and Hovland, there you go. I know that's four picks, and I sound like one of those other um, preposterous people who will give you 17 outrights every week. Um, right. But the fact that, you know, he definitely was on my radar. So he's yours. Hopefully he cashes for everyone. Yeah. I mean, look, I don't think we're going too far down the board this week at another uh, big field with some big names there. I, I got a little grief from one person on social media. So, oh, wow, he picked Tony Fina. And like, look, I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't taking the victory lap. I think I retweeted something that Action had sent out. Oh, you're big old victory lap on Tony Fino. Big deal. He was second on the board. I said, that's fair. Look, I'm I'm really not, you know, I'm not bragging about it whatsoever. That said, we make picks every week. Any other pick that I would have made or you would have made last week would have been wrong. We <laughs> got the one right. And so to be told, hey, big deal. <laughs> got it right it wasn't that hard it's like well that sounds like a lose-lose situation either get yeah. it right and it wasn't that hard and you shouldn't have gotten it right because 
you know, big deal. Or you would have just gotten it wrong, and then you're dumb because how do you not pick Fee now? He was right up there. So in any case, I guess it should be that easy every time. All right, and because it's a designated event, and I know we've gone through our picks and time's running out, but is there a player that you haven't? I squeezed in extra guys this week, everywhere I could. Is there a guy we haven't mentioned at all that could do something that you can think of? Because I've got one, um, but we'll see. I'm going to my preview that I wrote. Uh, you know what? I'll give you a name here because I've been on him for a while. I He teamed with a guy that we mentioned, Keith Mitchell, at the Zurich Classic just a Ooh. few weeks ago. Played in the President's Cup last year. Played very well for the international side. Sun Im is trending in the right direction. He may wind up being my PGA Championship pick. I like him better in a few weeks than I do yeah, this I like week. That. But yeah, good things are coming for Sanjay. All right, the one I'll throw out at you, and again, he's high on the board, but I just haven't mentioned him. He's uh, also a President's Cup guy, but from the Yanks, and that's Xander Shoffle. I think Xander is somewhat of a pick here. Uh, he's he's not fallen into me into mine, but at least now, if he wins, I can say, well, we kind of mentioned him at the end. <laughs> Let's see how we go. Uh, that doesn't count. Uh, no no, no social enough. media post for Ben if Correct. Xander Shoffley wins this week. And you're like, I just want to mention Xander before we go. No, it doesn't count. It does not count. Get no credit for that. Uh, uh, fair enough. Fair enough, too. As always, uh, we appreciate you, Benny. I know you were out there playing golf at LACC doing uh, yeah, rough day. the Lord's work out there. Boy, uh, <laughs> you know, just, uh, taking one for the team. I, I get it. But uh, thanks to everybody out there for listening. Remember, you can find... The Links and Locks Best Bets podcast, wherever you find your favorite podcast, download, subscribe, rate, and listen every single week during the entire PGA Tour season. For Ben Everill, I'm Jason Sobel. Fuck with all of your bets for this week's Wells Fargo Championship. Here's hoping you. It's green.